All right, good afternoon, good morning. Hello, friends. Welcome back to another Together at Home webcast. My name is Matt Vance. I am the Woodwind Product Specialist for Buffet Crampon USA. I would like to welcome you to this week's webcast and thank you for tuning in. First, I hope you all are healthy and well. It's great to have you joining us today and it is great to be joined by our special guest from Minnesota. Uh, he is the uh, professor of saxophone at the University of Minnesota. He is an extremely accomplished saxophone soloist and he is also a Senzo saxophone artist. He is Preston Duncan. Preston, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? Oh, great, Matt. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Oh, terrific. It, it looks like you are in your home studio today, which looks very festive, actually. I'm hoping maybe uh, some of us can come over uh, after the webcast and enjoy a, a, a cold beverage or something. But Right. Well, you know, as soon as I knew I was going to be home for any length of time, my first thought was I need a place to practice. And I need a place to record and make videos. Minnesota stuff. is an uh, oh, we're getting a little feedback there. Sorry about that. Hey, um, so I, I'm glad you brought that up. Obviously, with, with everything being as it is, uh, myself included, a lot of people have outfitted their homes to do recording or to do presentations or to practice. Um, it looks like you've got a, a quite a setup there. Could you talk a little bit about what you've, you've done in your basement? Uh, yeah, well, it's it's kind of like a basement. It's, it's a walkout basement. So I have a door to the outside and then I have uh, three windows that are closed right now for lighting. But what I did was I put up some uh, sound material, acoustic material, acoustic foam, and I sound treated the room so it wouldn't be too live and it'd be good for recording video and audio. And then um, I, you know, put in floor flooring and, and that's about it, you know, and I got my microphones and all my stuff set up to where I can do really good video recordings now. And I've been spending a lot of time this summer learning new uh, applications like uh, uh, Final Cut uh, and, and different, uh, something better than iMovie to make videos. Uh, and doing a lot of editing and doing some recording of just solo music that's not with video and arranging and you know I have it all here so yeah I never right. have to leave the house again <laughs> well right. you might not be able to at this rate right, right, right. Yeah. So, um so I now are you also doing some audio recording while you're there or is it primarily video or what what have you been focusing on I've been doing uh mostly with the video it has been I guess you would call it pre-production. I've just been writing out uh, some educational like curriculum stuff uh, and figuring out how I'm gonna piece everything together. And then um, but the, and then doing some recordings, I recorded the uh, Jeannie Neurath Sonata for solo alto saxophone, which I released the first movement on uh, YouTube and then I had the other two movements finished, but I'm waiting a little bit to release those. Uh, and then I've been doing other recording projects. I'm recording uh, some Piazzolla and some Bach and, and then collaborative projects uh, online. So I did a trio with a, a friend of mine, a very good saxophonist, uh, Davide Nari and Federico Girini who plays piano. We did a trio uh, recording and then put that online of a piece by a Mexican composer, uh, Blake Perez Santiago. And then I did another piece with the saxophone choir in Lisbon at the Superior School there they did these arrangements of the Fairling Etudes. So we did uh, a recording of one of those with me playing solo and then playing accompaniment. Uh, and then there's been a Extremely of accomplished. Sorry about that. It's all right. <laughs> there's been a couple other things uh, like that, just that, you know, just trying to stay busy and active, you know, because all the performing right now is done, so. Well, you and I were laughing before we went live. Um, the last time Preston and I saw each other was at the uh, the NASA Biennial Conference yeah. in Tempe, Arizona. That was in March, and that was literally right before everything shut down. And so I, you've already touched on this a little bit, but in terms of, of performance, in terms of teaching, in terms of, of just keeping your musical sanity, if you could talk a little bit more about some of the things that you've been doing uh, since we last saw each other at the NASA conference. Oh, well, to keep saying, I, I'm, the jury's still out, <laughs> so whether or not that is being accomplished. Uh, you know, I try to stick to a schedule, and I practice every day. You know, the two things that I did as soon as I, in March, actually, when I figured this is going to go on for a while, was to get 
this area put together and then the home gym. So I, I've been doing that to stay sane. Cause if I mm -hmm. just work constantly then I kind of go a little crazy. Um, but you know, just trying to treat it like a work day, even though it's tempting cause I'm home to be like, oh, I'm going to go play Xbox for an hour. It's like, no, I can't do that. I have to treat it like I'm at work. So yeah. Yeah. Have you been doing some teaching as well? A lot of teaching. Yeah. I have some summer students. And then of course I taught my college students in the spring. I give them some of them lessons during the summer uh, if they want them. Yeah. And it's been all exclusively online. You haven't been having lessons outside or anything like that. Or... It's all online. Yeah. 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 Do you feel like, uh, you feel like that's, you've seen kind of an evolution or an improvement in that process as you've gone along or, or, you know, you've learned how to do things better or what do you think? Uh, well, I think, uh, I think, you know, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, you know, obviously this whole thing is terrible, uh, but there's a real opportunity here uh, because people have been forced to adopt technologies that they were slower to adopt. So you can see like looking out in the future that lessons are probably, you know, as broadband increases and, and uh, the quality of a, uh, of the connection increases, you can see that lessons are going to be done online. Like the, the overhead of having a building and a physical place to go to is it's not, not necessary. Mm -hmm. So you can see this is kind of, and not just in music, but in a lot of different things, you know, I think it's pushing everything kind of forward faster. So um, there's definitely been some benefits to teaching online. There are obviously drawbacks, but uh, it's, been great to learn about it and for also for my students to make it part of their lessons to sort of do online projects, you know, and to learn the technology behind it because they're going to need it. Right. So it's been a, an opportunity, I think. Well, and I think you bring up a good point. I, I think, and I'm guilty of this, especially is that there had been some resistance to evolving that process and, and learning more about the technology over time. And, and we've all been kind of pushed and forced it, into doing that. Um, and, and I think learning how to use the technology, learning how to negotiate the technology in terms of just like we were doing before we went live, making sure the mic levels were, were proper so we could actually get, get a good level on your saxophone playing that wasn't overwhelming the microphone, those types of things. I, I think that was that was uh, that was going to be helpful as well. Um, if you're just joining us, by the way, first of all, welcome. Thank you for tuning in this afternoon. We're with uh, Senzo saxophone artist Preston Duncan. He's joining us live from Minneapolis, Minnesota. He is the uh, professor of saxophone at the University of Minnesota. Preston, um, I think it might be interesting for our viewers if you could uh, fill us in a little bit on on your journey to getting to the University of Minnesota. I know you've had a lot of different experiences. I know you were a Fulbright scholar at one point, or you are a Fulbright scholar. Um, you've, you've studied uh, internationally as well as in the United States. Um, with your career being so successful and being where you are now, um, I think it would be interesting if, if people knew your journey and your, your process in getting to where you are now. Well, I'm, I mean, I, Okay, uh, I guess uh, the thing I would stress about my years of school is that I tried to, you know, it's very tempting. I think students want to pick one teacher they like, and, and a lot of times they get kind of convinced to stay with that teacher, right? Because the teacher doesn't want to share them. Uh, I don't do that. I have a rule where my students, my undergraduates have to go somewhere else because I don't want them to just have me. I mean, I'm great, but I'm just kidding. Uh, but the thing is, there are just, there are so many different ways of playing that are really good. And there's teachers have different perspectives and different ways of looking at music. So my three, my, my three main teachers, four main teachers were Eugene Rousseau, Johnny Formal, John Sampin, and Ken Radnofsky. And my first saxophone teacher was George Wolf in high school. So those four, and I also did some work with Don Sinta and, uh, and other people in master classes. So um, those four are very different, have very different approaches to the saxophone, they're in different approaches to music. And I picked them because that's what I wanted. And I think each, a couple of them were frustrated with my choice to go to a couple of the other ones that I chose. 
uh, but whatever, I don't really care that much. Um, so for education, that's kind of what I did. And I got my uh, Fulbright in France, and then I got my master's with John Sanford, and then Ken Rodnowski was an artist diploma, and Rousseau was my doctor and my undergrad. So then I finished there, and I joined the Army for three years, great student loan repayment program. Uh, I was uh, ended up getting injured when I was in the Army pretty significantly. I, I couldn't play for a couple of years, and I had several surgeries. Um, it took me about seven years after that to be able to practice regularly. So that period, I didn't really have a career. I, I didn't do anything. I couldn't perform or anything. I did some work on my doctorate, uh, kind of struggled through that, uh, that, that whole thing. And then uh, in 2012, I found a, a device that I could use called the sax holder, which took the pressure off because I had tried everything, you know, I had tried stands and playing while only sitting, and everything had a problem because of the way that the spine is used in various things. Uh, so it wasn't until 2012 that I was able to really put the time in. And from that point, uh, I started doing what I think every other classical saxophonist that wants a job does. You take on way too much adjunct teaching. So I did that for three years, teaching at five different places. Uh, and making sure that I was performing internationally and, and doing all the things I needed to do to, to be prepared to get a good job. And then when the job came open here, uh, I was lucky enough to get it. And that's kind of where how I got here teaching. I think knowing we're so helped, I'm going to be totally honest. Mm -hmm. I do think I was qualified and I do think I've been knocking out of the park with the job, but uh, so many of these jobs, if you look at people that are in places where their teacher was. Um, it's because the teacher that's leaving has a um, opinion about how they want things to continue, about their legacy. And, and I think the teacher generally has a lot of input into, hey, I want this person, you know, so. Sure. Uh, speaking of former teachers, uh, Ken Radnofsky is joining us this afternoon. He says to tell you hello and you are great. Ah. Yeah, Ken, thanks for joining us. It's, it's been a long time since we've spoken. I hope you're doing well. Yeah, hey Ken, I can't see your comments, but nice to be seen by you. It'd be great to see you. He says you are great. Oh wow, thanks. So you're great too, uh, Ken. Uh, also, some of my uh, Buffet Grandpod colleagues are chiming in to tell you hello as well. Chris Coppinger, uh, Lori Orr, Declan Lynch—they're all tuning in this afternoon, and they send their their warm regards to you as well. Great, hello everyone. Blanket, hello. Yeah, you've got quite a fan club built up here. So. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's good, yeah. Um, I, Sal Lozano is joining us as well. Sal Lozano, I don't, do you know Sal? Uh, I know the name for sure. Sal, Sal is one of the top LA, uh, LA guys, uh, studio musicians. He plays in Gordon Goodwin's big band and he sends oh, his yeah. cards as well. He's joining us. So Sal, thanks for tuning in this afternoon. Yeah, hi, thanks. So, um, we, we were talking earlier about some of the things that you've been doing uh, pandemic wise since everything has is, is become a little more restrictive. I know that you actually, of all the projects that you talked about, all the recordings that you've done, you, you did a recording um, of romance that you have put on YouTube. Could you talk a little bit about that recording and the process involved and how you made it? Yeah, I mean, you know, I love the piece, the Amy Beach Romance. There was an arrangement of it done. I did a different arrangement uh, of, of, the, of the piece, which I actually have published on my website. Um, but I love the piece. Uh, it's gorgeous. And what I did to record it was I had played it a bunch with my uh, pianist, Casey, but we couldn't get together to record it. So, you know, you end up, because of the limits of the technology, having to figure out ways of kind of around it. So. I had him record the piano part. Ideally, I was gonna have him do it in MIDI so that I could move things if needed, but he couldn't do that, so it was just an audio file. And then what I did was I played the audio file through my headphones and practiced a lot, uh, syncing up with his time, because obviously he couldn't adjust to me. I had to make everything fit him, which was kind of hard to do. And kind of back, a lie. <laughs> yeah, kind of backwards from how it usually is, right? Yeah, so we did. Uh, so I did that, and then I I, I, I filmed the playing, performing it, and, and edited and stuff. And did it right here. So. Okay, so you did the editing there as well. Yep. 
yeah. in the video okay. and all that, which is why actually that was the video that made me want to switch to a different uh, video program than I, iMovie because it just the the it's and I got a better camera, so the next the things coming out will be better. Sure, sure. I'm learning how to do production. It's not that easy. No, it's <laughs> fine. You're right. Um, Warren Coos is my producer today. He's our high brass product specialist, and um, we're going to see if we can get technology to cooperate with us and and watch watch this video uh, during today's presentation. So, uh, Warren, if you are able to to get that video queued up, uh, let's see. Uh, by the way, if you're joining, just tuning in, we're with our uh, Senzo saxophone artist Preston Duncan joining us live on our Together at Home webcast. He is from his home studio in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And we're gonna see if we can view uh, the video that he produced during the pandemic. So uh, we're going to share a screen. Let's I will say originally the video was cheesier, but I was encouraged to change it. I had a little candle next to me because uh, it's like romance. Sure. Yeah, but I had people tell me, I got advice to not do that. So. I think that sounds lovely. I, I thought it would be great. Like, it's funny. You know what I mean? Like, why not do that? Sure. Okay, you can let's see go. the candle glow if you want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see what we have here. Romance by Preston Duncan. And Casey Rick.
That's lovely. Beautiful. Thanks. Beautiful plane. And I, I can see how that would have been challenging to, to put together, especially uh, when, when the roles are reversed and you're actually following the pianist as opposed to the pianist accompanying and following you. Bravo. Uh, yeah, thank you. The hard parts were when the pianist would not play for a while and I had this long melody and it's like it just took a lot of, a lot of time to yeah. count through it and make, be sure to land ex exactly right. Oh, no, I can't right. imagine how challenging that was. Yeah. No, I can't, I can't wait to record it. Uh, Cause I'm going to, as soon as I can, I'm going to do it in the studio like with a sine wave, like a D and it'll be, uh, there are places I'd like to take more time. I mean, Casey did a great job because he remembered how I played it, but there are still places that I've changed a little and uh, it'd be nice to get a real version of it done. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, one thing before uh, we move on to my next question for you, Mark Overton from SaxQuest is saying hello. Oh, hey, Mark. Yeah, so it's great to have you joining us, Mark. Mark uh, Overton is at SaxQuest in St. Louis. He is one of the exclusive Senzo dealers in the United States, uh, along with Schmidt Music around Minneapolis. And uh, Mark, if, if you're not familiar with, with Mark and SaxQuest, uh, one of the premier saxophone specialty shops in the world, as well as the United States. And uh, he has been uh, uh, a great supporter of the Senzo saxophone since it was introduced a few years ago. So Mark, thanks for tuning in. Um, if we could talk a little bit about the Senzo saxophone, um, and I know you've been playing Senzo for several years now, what what drew you to to playing the Senzo saxophone after playing some other models and brands over the years? Well, I mean, I'd only ever really played Yamaha uh, since high school, and I I had uh, I had a sixty two, and then I had a custom, and then I had a EX, and then an EX two, um, and then I went to teach. I was teaching at a, a camp in uh, called Ticino Musica. It's in Switzerland. And I was with uh, Yvonne Rote, who's a dear friend, uh, and I think one of the best saxophonists that's ever lived. Um, he, uh, he was playing a senzo, and he said, you have to try this. And you know, I said, okay, but I'm probably not gonna like it, because usually that's the case. Like somebody says, try an instrument, and you get your hands on something, and it's not great. So I tried it, and um, it was very different at first, but there was something about it. There was the proportion of the way that it, I don't know if you'd say proportion, but the way the intonation pattern fit immediately seemed, though I was foreign to me, seemed more manageable. And the uh, the sound, like it felt like, I, it's like a, if you put your hand in a bag of seeds, you know what I mean? If you're wearing a like a like a thin latex glove, how that would feel, versus taking it, you know what I mean? Like it was just like so much color and texture in the sound. And I thought, wow, I really got to spend some time with this. So I called Mark, which is where I got mine. He sent me a couple and I, I spent a couple weeks with it. And I, I was just, all of the things I liked got better. You know, I feel like I have more color. Like when I play loud, I can just have this soaring sound. It's like, it's like, a, it's like it goes to 11 or something. I don't really know. And then, uh, yeah, and just I was completely sold. Yeah. yeah. Now, I, if I don't know if, if our viewers can see from uh, the image, you're you're actually playing a silver plate. That's very lovely, by the way. You're playing, you're playing a silver plated senzo, but then you have the copper copper neck. So uh, that that's an interesting combination. I assume you tried different combinations before you you finally settled on that that configuration. I'm not totally sold on plating. I think I've talked to you about this. Like, I think there's a lot of woo, you know, behind things like that. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine that a couple microns thick of a material that is valued by scarcity and not acoustic property. I can't imagine that that is going to have a huge effect on the saxophone. It's certainly a beneficial effect. Um, but I did try a couple and I like this one the best. And uh, they just happened to be silver. And then uh, I tried out some necks, and I like this one the best, and it happened to be not silver. Mm -hmm. So that's just kind of how it worked out. It wasn't a commitment. 
or any kind of thought about plating as much. Um, there are people that swear the silver sounds different. And if I pick up one that's not silver plated and I play it, it sounds different. If I pick up another silver plated one, it sounds different. Like they're, you know, they're handmade up. So there's going to be a little variation, right? Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I can't tell much about plating. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I guess the point is you weren't drawn to that instrument just because it was silver plated. You were drawn to that instrument because it worked best for you. Yes. Don't yeah. care about the plating. In fact, yeah. silver gets kind of dirty, which I'm starting to think looks kind of cool, but it was hard to keep clean when I was committed to trying to keep it clean. Yeah. No, I think it looks very cool, actually. Um, you know, one thing I noticed in, in the YouTube recording that we just viewed, um, the, the intonation was was just spot on, which obviously speaks to you as, as a world-class player. But um, I, I think that's something that a lot of people have talked about with the Senzo saxophone is the fact that the, the overtone series, the, the intonation, the tuning within itself is, is so much more accurate than what people have been used to in the past. Um, is, is that something that you've noticed or when you initially, you, you said that when you first got on the Senzo, it was, it was different. And I wonder if that might have been one of the things that was a little different for you. Well, I mean, the intonation it, to me is the huge thing, right? It's, it's a just, it, it's so liberating to not have to constantly be putting down crazy fingerings to try to get things to work. Um, uh, and that piece is a good example of it because there's a lot of C sharps, right? So like trying to play that middle C sharp with the right color uh, on a couple of the other leading brands I won't mention, or the high C sharp and the low C sharp um, is just really, really hard. And I've, I've done it before, not with that piece, but with other pieces. And it's just, you end up having to use all these fingerings that, that change the color and it's kind of an issue. Um, but the intonation on this is just a lot easier to handle. And the thing that I think is a little confusing to people when they try it is it's different, right? So like the distance between the C sharp and the D in the middle is pretty much right on. Like it's, you know, the C sharp can be a little bit low, but it's not anything you can't handle. Uh, and the D is maybe a little sharp, but again, not like the other saxophones. But then when you get lower in the like C, B, you know, A and G, those notes are actually a little sharp, like mm -hmm. in, without the octave key, which is different than a lot of instruments. Sure. Um, but that's easy. Like those notes are easy to, to lower, right? So you're kind of, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like the, there's always going to be problem notes because of the way a saxophone is, it, it's, it, it can't be perfect. The, uh, but it's kind of where do you decide to have the problem notes? And a lot of saxophones have made it so that those left hand notes, G, A, B, C, and C sharp are low. You can't deal with that. I can't deal with that, right? Because how am I going to raise them? I can raise an A, I can raise an A sharp and a B a little with all these fingerings. But if it's just a little bit high, then all of a sudden the low notes now are much more in tune and the, the upper octave is more in tune. It's just, it's a lot easier, easier. And, and the instrument is different. I mean, it's shorter, right? Uh, and it's wider than, than the other, uh, it's different scale, I guess you'd say. Mm -hmm. but, it, uh, but it's much easier to handle. And I play a lot, I mean, I played in tune before, I think, but it's easier. Sure. You know? I mean, if, if you're not, if you don't, that note that I come in on that's just exactly in tune is so much fun to play because it's a C sharp, high C sharp. And I've had so many years of trauma with high C sharp <laughs> that on this instrument, it's like I just go, I just aim a little down. It's exactly there. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I couldn't do that on a, a different saxophone. Sure. Okay. Okay. No, that's a great explanation. Um, uh, in, in our pre show talk, uh, and we were talking about you you playing something during today's webcast. Uh, you were working with one of the Bach cello suites, uh, right. which I think is is a terrific a terrific example of the the stability of the intonation uh, within the instrument because of the fact it's got so many large intervals. Having that security to to know that the the notes are going to slot properly uh, when you're going from a very low note to a very high note. Um, is that something that you maybe you could demonstrate a little bit for us uh, so we can we can hear it? Yeah, yeah, sure. I can do that. I it's funny, I just took my reed off to wet it and it's plastic. <laughs> but it's, it's like so many years of like wetting my reed. I cannot I can't just 
clay, I have to make sure that it's wet. Sure, no, I, I understand. Oh. Uh, and by the way, uh, some other people tuning in this afternoon, sending their regards, Jimmy Merchant from BG France. Oh yeah, hey Jimmy. Yeah, so we, we get, all got to spend a lot of time together at the NASA conference and so. Is it okay? Um, I think so. The the F and the F sharp, it sounded like it clipped a little bit. So maybe. We're not, we won't be up there, so I should be all right. Okay, there you go. No, it sounds fantastic, beautiful. So, and, and I think that that's a, a terrific example, not only of your flexibility as a player, but the flexibility, flexibility of the instrument. The fact that, you know, those low B flats, the Bs, the Cs are just speaking, just like notes in the middle and the upper register. It's, it's really- Oh, yeah. Yeah, and you don't have to, uh, every time you hit a low D, you don't have to put down your low C sharp. And, you know, right. It's like, just stuff like that. It's like, you know, yeah, it's beautiful. a pleasure. It's a great horn. A great um, so you, you mentioned when you were getting ready to play the Bach that, that you play on plastic reeds, which I think would probably surprise a lot of people that, um, that, that are in the industry or that are classical players. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about that and, and, and what you like about them and, and what they provided for you. Well, um, you know, that romance was done on a, on a, on a Legere reed too, uh, synthetic reed. I don't, know if it, I don't know if they like it called plastic, but it's synthetic, right? Um, you know, I, I played them a little bit before and then I, I was traveling a lot and the, the altitude change and the humidity change just messes with your reeds. And I kind of committed to just switching. And then after a, a couple, it didn't take very long, a couple of weeks, uh, it started to sound real good. Like as good as a cane reed, uh, even better because you have time to adjust to like there, everything has an imperfection, right? But you have time to adjust to it because you don't have to throw it away as soon as you get used to it. Um, it's been a game changer for me. Yeah, I don't have to worry about uh, my reads anymore and it's like a huge load off psychologically. Yeah, sure. How long have you been playing on the synthetic reads now? About two years, I think. Wow. Yeah, and I just started working with them, uh, I think in March, right? Because yeah. I wanted to make sure I don't want to change. Reads are one of those things, you know. I I had never really um, never spent too much time. I did some stuff with reed companies before, but it seemed like every two years you change, you know, because there's like one brand comes out and then another. All of a sudden, their cane starts being not as good, and then another one is good cane, and then do that. Um, but with these reads, I I I don't see how it can get much better. So I don't see that I would ever need yeah. to switch. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, if you're just joining us this afternoon, we are with Senzo saxophone artist, Preston Duncan. Uh, my name is Matt Vance. I'm the Woodwind Product Specialist for Buffet Crampon USA. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is our latest installment of Together at Home webcast. We are thrilled to have Preston join us. Um, Preston, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, uh, which is, a departure from from the Bach that you just played is your new is your new album, 
and uh, the title track of the album, Holy Roller, and um, which is which is a, a phenomenal piece. And I, I was doing a little bit of research on it uh, before our webcast today. Um, this is a brand new album for you, a brand new recording. Um, maybe if you could talk a little bit about the inspiration of putting this album together, some of the other cuts on it, as well as um, the the decision or the inspiration rather to to name the album after that one particular piece by Libby Larson. Okay, well, I have two kind of albums I put out recently that I think are that are my first professional recordings. Uh, and they just they just now uh, like last week uh, got on Spotify and iTunes and Amazon Music and all that. Um, I didn't. I don't really didn't initially like the idea of just having a full length CD for the sake of it, you know, because used to that was like that, that was necessary because of the way music was distributed. Um, so the original idea was, you know, De Crook, beautiful piece. I had an idea. I did the album cover and for both the CDs, and I had this idea of how I wanted it to look, and it, it seemed like it could stand on its own. And why put something else with it, right? And then Holy Roller was the same thing. I love the piece and I, I like, I love the idea of the piece. And I found this awesome picture that's on the cover of this old Southern Baptist minister preaching and just hellfire. And it's, I just love it so much. Um, so I, I wanted that on its own too. But then the other two pieces that I put with it, I didn't necessarily think needed to be on their own. I don't, you know, the Gotkovsky, the Brilliance is a flashy, nice, fun piece. I, it's, you know, it's not like, a masterwork, right? Uh, and the Candy Charter is very short, so that really shouldn't be on its own. So I, I kind of put those with it and made sort of a short recording. It's like a just under a half hour of music. Yeah, you know, I I wasn't familiar with the the background of, of Holy Roller. I've, I've heard the piece several times before, but I, I didn't know the inspiration uh, behind the composition. Um, it, it, Obviously, it's a very interesting piece. Maybe if you could elaborate a little more for those that aren't familiar with it, um, what it's about, what the inspiration was, and, and maybe uh, why you you chose to make it the, the title track for the for the new album. Yeah, I worked with uh, Libby Larson a little bit with it. Um, you know, it wasn't it was not it was written way before I played it. Um, but she, they asked me to play at her Lifetime Celebration Award composer. I'm sure that's not the title. Something like that. It was a big event. There was a documentary and everything. And I got to play it there. And then she got to hear it. And I got some comments and ideas. But basically, the piece is sort of from the voice of an old uh, uh, preacher from sort of like the Southern Baptist tradition. I'm not sure it was Southern Baptist exactly. It's just that's where my family's from. So I can see that really clearly that you know, like my, my grandfather, great grandfather was a preacher and had this thing, you know, in Kentucky where fire and brimstone stuff. Um, so uh, it's from the voice of, a, of, a, of, of someone giving a, giving sort of a sermon, right? And it goes between, just like all good sermons, it goes between ecstatic and meditative, right? And they're like, that's what they used to work people up, right? Mm -hmm. And it's got these really uh, clear uh, sort of, references to that style of, of orating and uh i love that about it so the whole time i'm thinking in character it's like a character piece you know okay what would this what does this want to sound like you know um but i just uh i just love the piece i think it's great and i think it's worthy of having it's having a cover of the cd mm -hmm. you know and I, I love that picture anyway. oh it's phenomenal yeah, and we'll we'll share a link to the album in the comments section. Oh, thanks, thank you. Yeah, so people can check it out. Uh, one of the things I like about the piece too is, I mean, obviously technically it's very difficult, but you can hear a story being told, uh, not only in the composition but also in your performance as well. That you really do get a feel of of that that uh, that imagery in your head as far as the the Southern Baptist re revival sessions and the preaching and and getting the congregation worked up yeah i think oh cool thanks yeah i mean i just announced it to the world this morning that that was out there so you're the first person to give me a, a good comment on that so no 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 it's terrific <laughs> uh 
Um, let's let's talk about a couple of other things um, in the remaining minutes that we have. We've talked a lot about the Senzo saxophones. Um, uh, a lot of people are also familiar with the other buffet models that are in production currently, the 400 series entry-level professional saxophones and the 100 series student saxophones. I know you've spent a little bit of time with those instruments. Uh, I know Declan Lynch, who's our former division manager for your area, um, worked with you on some events. Um, what's your experience with those instruments and, and what, what do you have to tell our, our viewers about the 400 and the 100 series? Well, I mean, the 400 and the 100 are both very different from the Senzo, mm. right? They're not the same at all, but they're really good. Like the 400 I tried and, uh, you know, it's, it's a different feel completely, but it's a good quality instrument. And I wouldn't have a problem with a student, you know, playing on one because the intonation was still good. Uh, the, the, it played really well. Uh, I like the sound. It, you can see it's a, maybe a little more versatile. I don't know how it's marketed, but maybe it's kind of for jazz and classical mm. kind of thing. Um, but it's, uh, it, was a, it was a real nice instrument. And then the student instrument's fine. And it's great. You know, it's, it's what you want in a student instrument. It's built well, solid, uh, good in, reasonably good at everything. You know, kind of like all student instruments, they can't be great at anything because you just can't do that for a, a student instrument super easy. I don't think you can do it at all. I've never seen one that could. Um, but for a student, it is a quality instrument that I don't think uh, it'd be hard to improve upon at the price point. You yeah. know what I mean? It's put together well, plays well. I could play on it if I needed to. It'd be fine, you know? Do you work with a lot of young saxophonists or are you primarily working with, with collegiate uh, players or? I work with some young saxophonists. I don't do it here in Minneapolis, but like uh, I was just in, well before all this, I was in Mexico doing a thing for, it was like middle school to high school. And uh, yeah, I do stuff with younger, with younger saxophonists. I, I really like younger saxophonists. Yeah. There's not as much broken. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let's talk a little bit. Uh, I was going to ask you about Mexico anyway. You spent quite quite a bit of time um, working in those countries, doing performances, doing clinics and master classes. Um, how did you get into that? And, and what what do you enjoy about, about going to different countries and working with students? Well, it's fun to travel. The food, right? Just right. by itself. But um, so traveling's fun. I'm not sure if you agree with that anymore because you travel so much with your job. Well, it depends on where I go. Yeah, but but sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I played at uh, the Encuentro in, in Mexico City. It's called the International Saxophone Meeting in Mexico City with Roberto Benitez Alonso, saxophonist at um, UNAM. Met a lot of people. Um, I had been to Costa Rica with Javier Valerio, dear friend of mine. Um, he teaches at UCR in Sonsax, everybody knows him. Um, and then you just meet people and then you get invited to do things. And then next thing you know, you're on public television in Uruguay. You know, it's like, it's, it's kind of crazy. Uh, but it, uh, I love going down there. I think that the, all of the countries in Latin America generally have sort of the same issue of a lack of resources, right? right? So it's kind of hard for them to, to get all the gadgets and all the things, but they, music is such an important part of their lives and they, they want to get better so bad. And it's just, uh, you know, I do a master class somewhere in Minnesota at a different school and I'll get 15 people because, you know, it's like a small college and there's only so many saxophones, but I do one in Mexico city and I get 200. Because, wow. be, well, because, you know, it's like people love saxophone and they want to get better. And they're like, Oh, here's a guy that apparently knows what he's doing. We'll see. Uh, and then they come to your class. So it's sort of like, I really love that about Latin America. And the people are very warm and yeah, I just love it. Yeah, oh, that's fantastic. Um, I know summer typically is a very busy time for you traveling to uh, to Mexico or to Latin America. And, and obviously all that has been, been curtailed. Uh, do you have any plans to, to head there in the next academic year or next summer uh, if, if things loosen up a little bit? Well, I've been doing a lot in uh, in Italy recently, in Portugal I did some stuff, and I was supposed to go on a tour 
last month or two months ago to China and then to Italy. And those both got postponed because of this. Um, uh, so those will be moved to hopefully the fall, but it's, I don't feel optimistic about that. I think it's probably going to be next summer. And then, uh, and then I have some work to do in, in, uh, Mexico city with my friend, Sophia, we have a recording we've been wanting to do. And then I've got another, uh, some stuff with the guitarist in, in Costa Rica that I'm trying to convince to, uh, do some more recording. So. With a guitarist. Yeah. We did some recording, uh, a couple of years ago in Costa Rica. He's a flamenco guitarist. He's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I think that would be a, actually a really interesting color combination. We had some really nice pieces written for us and we recorded a couple of them. Uh, I have to redo the soprano part. I'm not happy with the outcome uh, in terms of the way it was mic'd. Mm. It sounds like I'm like right in your face, which is nobody wants that with soprano. <laughs> <laughs> just keep just keep it back a little bit, you know, and just keep your distance. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, we, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, thank you for joining us, everybody. If you're tuning in or if you're just joining us, we're with Senzo saxophone artist, Preston Duncan. Uh, he's joining us from Minneapolis, Minnesota. My name is Matt Vance. I'm the Woodwind Product Specialist for Buffet Grimp on USA. This is uh, the latest episode in our continuing series of Together at Home webcast. And uh, we're glad you're here. If you do have any questions or comments, or if you'd just like to say hello, to Preston, uh, you can put it in our comments section. Uh, I'll be happy to pass those along to him. Uh, I meant to mention earlier, Philippe Leconte from uh, France sends his regards. He's joining us this afternoon or evening, I should say, over in France. And uh, Donnie Todd, who is our Southeast uh, Division Manager, is tuning in from South Carolina and he sends his warm regards as well. Hello, everyone. Yeah, so. Um, what would you like to share with our viewers this afternoon um, as far as things that you have upcoming, uh, things at the university, um, the projects you're working on, uh, anything you'd like uh, our viewers to know about? Um, I guess the main thing is that, you know, I'm in this, I haven't really been great about getting my YouTube channel uh, subscribed to, and I'm not too far from a thousand people. And as soon as I get a thousand people, then I have access to these community buttons where I can, it's kind of complicated, but I can put recordings on there that I can't put on there otherwise. Mm. If I put a recording on public and it doesn't, and I, I don't want to put it on public. I want to put it on private and send it just to my people that subscribe to me. Sure. Cause if I were to put say, for example, Libby Larson on a public recording and all of a sudden I got 20 million views, I would owe them a lot of money. Right. I, would, I would make not near as much from YouTube as, as I owe the company that, that has the rights. So subscribe to my YouTube channel. That's the thing. That's it's just Preston, Preston Saxon. Yep, Preston Saxon. We'll try to put a link to that in the comments. Thank section. you. I'm very close. We can do it. Yes, I, I have no doubt we can do that. Right. Um, as far as school in the fall, uh, what's the university doing at this point? Right now they're in session. Uh, and I'm not sure it's going to hold up, mm. but we'll see. Uh, I have the option of working from home, which I will probably do because my mom lives here and I, I don't want to endanger her. Sure, sure, absolutely. So you'll be doing lessons from home. Are, are you able to do any kind of quartets or ensembles or anything like that with your, your students? Or We're going to work that out a little differently in the fall. In the spring, chamber music class was uh, listening. We just did a lot of listening to different there's so much good chamber music for saxophone that we took the opportunity in a couple months to just dive in and spend some time listening. Yeah, terrific. Okay. Um, I do want to uh, promote your website if people would like to check things out there. We've already talked about your YouTube channel. If, if you could uh, tell everybody about your website and what they can find there. Uh, well, there's some, you can buy the recordings. If you don't have a streaming service, you can also buy them on the streaming service. Um, it's PrestonSaxophone.com. Everything is Preston Saxophone. Facebook educational group that I have that has a bunch of free materials. You can ask to join. It's closed. Um, my Instagram, everything is Preston Saxophone. So it's easy enough. Terrific. It's good. It's good branding. Yeah, no, that's terrific. It's great. Less is more. Yeah. Yeah. 
So uh, Preston saxophone is where you can find pretty much anything that Preston Duncan has produced, video or audio wise. Um, I want to thank you for joining us this oh, afternoon. Oh yeah, and I want to thank you you for asking me to come and you know and for making this great saxophone. And I I feel like uh, you know it's gonna more and more people are going to to get get it get get a clue about this and they're gonna. Uh, you're gonna, I think you're going to find that you'll have a very big share of the market in about five, five, ten years. Yeah, I hope so. Um, I'm really surprised no one has asked about Senzo soprano or tenor saxophones uh, in our webcast, but uh, we're, we're working. Developed, right? Yeah, we're working on them. It's, it's very hush hush at this point. But okay, well. Yeah, well, we'll edit that part out of the webcast. Oh, okay. Um, I do want to remind our, our viewers, uh, we do have uh, another Together at Home webcast coming up next week. Uh, we do one every Thursday through our New York showroom page. Uh, Warren Coos, who is today's producer, he's our high brass product specialist. He will be the host next week. Uh, he'll be joined by Amy Gilreath, who is one of our BNS trumpet artists. Uh, the topic will be touring and teaching. That's Thursday, August 6th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, we hope if you are a brass player, or even if you're not a brass player, you'll join us. Um, Preston, thank you once again for joining us. Uh, I'm glad you are healthy and well, as is your family. And uh, hopefully we will see each other uh, in person sooner than later, my friend. I hope so. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. All right. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. Take care. Bye.